the night endured for long after the rescue. Today we are talking to Gareth Russell about the Titanic. Bomb of grief that just kept exploding for these people when they realised there weren't other rescue ships, when they realised that um, it hadn't been women and children first, that in many cases it had been women and children only into the boats and that their husbands and their sons and their brothers and their fiancés were were among the frozen corpses that they could see in the distance. Everyone in that boat made it very clear that they could not persuade passengers to get into them. They started a music concert in first class and lit up the lounge and started serving cocoa, um, which doesn't exactly scream, get in the lifeboats, <laughs> there's a problem. The stewards and the stewardesses did not know it was sinking. So they didn't impart any urgency to the passengers. And so you had third class passengers sitting in the general room, just waiting. Astor, on at least two occasions, declined putting Madeline in a lifeboat because he thought the Titanic still felt so secure. I wonder, was the Titanic part of when we started to really lose the um, uh, prioritization of decency over entertainment and started to see people as headlines? In New York, nighttime sky lit up with the cruelly inappropriate flash bulbs of a thousand press cameras. There was a media frenzy uh, surrounding it. And I think it was one of, the, one of the first times that you saw real media intrusion into the lives of people who were suffering. But the Titanic has almost become a ship completely divorced from its its context. And it has become it it has become one of the few things in history that are that were real but have become legend. He tells a very dramatic story of how you know that the crew were pushing them back in and locking the gates that we then see in multiple movies about the Titanic. And it has, uh, I would argue, it's entered the the myths of the twentieth century. Uh, there were a lot of engineers from Belfast who sacrificed their lives to keep the power going for as long as possible. And they did really until about three or four minutes before it um, it sank, which is an extraordinary yeah. thing. What happened to them on the lifeboats was pretty horrendous in terms of not just the grief, but the physical impact. The doctor in the Carpathia wanted to amputate both his legs because of how badly damaged they were from exposure. And he said, you're no, begged him not to, and got up and walked in agony until he could prove he could keep using them. The number of times I mean, the first class male survivors were accused of having dressed as women. Male survivors had started there and then, just when it became clear how many people had died, they'd almost started to apologize for living. There were multiple ways that men survived that did not imply that they had elbowed women and children out of the way. But they had a chance to see the sun come up over this field of icebergs and that that nearly broke a lot of their spirits as well. Ghosting us of our own feelings to describe the silence after is was... Oh, extraordinary.